Hello and welcome to the Raptor Show on the Sports Radio Network. Make sure you find the Raptor Show wherever you listen to podcasts and subscribe. And please rate and review the show. A reminder, we're streaming live on Sportsnet's YouTube channel and airing live on Sportsnet 360, Monday to Friday from 2 to 3 p.m. I'm your host, William Liu. I'm joined by producer and co-host Alex Wong um, in the wake of a another loss to Kawhi. The Raptors have not beaten Kawhi since he left. Oh, maybe he just shouldn't have left. Uh, okay, yeah, fair. Um, and uh, we are also joined on the line by ESPN's Dave McMenamin. Dave, what's going on, man? Hey, what's well, going on? Not a lot. What's going on, fellas? You all right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dave. Had a little frog in my throat. Yeah. Dave, good. Dave coming in hot, man. It's no, all this, good. No, this is a, this is a big get in uh, Raptor show history, man. Appreciate you, Dave, for joining <laughs> us. I know you're a busy man. You know, I'll shout you out, too, because... Every time I see you doing your ESPN hits, I see a copy of Cover Story on, on your bookshelf in the back. So appreciate <laughs> right. the love. That's right. Appreciate the yes, love. Yes, sir. You got it. Um, yeah, so big topic. You know, definitely want to talk to you about the Lakers because, you know, the Raptors are, are going to be playing them tomorrow. But the dominant topic today coming out of yesterday's Raptors game was Fred Van Vliet, uh, his post-game, what would you call it, Will? A rant? A post-game rant? It's like a diss track, actually. Can, yeah. we, can we get some, like... Um just like this track kind of like music in the background yeah. as we play this clip from Fred where, I mean, he, like, listen, he, he decided to take the fine um, in calling up Ben Taylor and the rest of officiating this season. Yeah, so we have, we have the clip here, so let's play it and then we can chat about it. I don't mind. I'll take a fine. I don't really care. I thought, you know, um, Ben Taylor was f***ing terrible tonight. Um, I thought that on most nights, you know, a couple of the, you know, out of the three, there's one or two that just – the game up you know and it's, it's it's been like that a couple couple games in a row um denver was tough obviously you come out tonight you're competing pretty hard the third quarter i get a bullshit tech changes the whole dynamic of the game changes the whole flow of the game and um you know most of the refs are trying hard i like a lot of the refs are trying hard they're pretty fair they communicate well and then you got the other ones who just want to be dicks and um just kind of the game up nobody's coming to see that shit. they come to see the players and um i think we're losing a little bit of the fabric of what the NBA is and was, and um, it's been disappointing this season. Um, you can look up most of my texts this year have been with Ben Taylor officiating. So at a certain point as a player, you feel it's personal, and um, it's never a good place to be. That's not why we lost tonight. We got outplayed, um, but it definitely makes it tougher to overcome. Yeah, Dave, you know, I think, you know, throughout, throughout your years of covering the NBA and even looking at this season, like we've seen a lot of, players specifically call out you know the officiating crews and you know thinking about the lakers too i think the one that comes to mind was that controversial you know late game uh no call when when the lakers played the celtics in january and then jason tatum clearly fouled lebron at the end um when you hear these comments what do you make of these comments and have you have you ever heard a player go this directly at a specific ref I certainly haven't, Alex. Usually uh, players treat the refs like Voldemort, like he must not be named. Like they'll, they'll mention officials, they'll mention whistles, fouls. You never say the guy by name. I mean, think about before this rant by Fred Van Bleet, the biggest story associated with referees and the Raptors this week was Scotty Barnes getting run. And it's not like you heard people saying Scott Foster. And certainly Scott Foster's reputation – precedes him but you know and there's that stat something about the record of chris paul teams when scott foster's refereeing those games and it's not like you hear chris paul uh saying scott foster's name so certainly surprising to to hear it uh and i've seen a growing amount of uh players feeling comfortable um expressing those grapes and whether it is because the Punishment system is not that punitive where, you know, if you're making $40 million a year and you're going to get fined $25,000 for talking about the ref, like, are you really going to feel that? Maybe it's some of that. And maybe it's some of, you know, someone like LeBron James, because he sets the tone for so many things that happen in this league, the way he reacted in Boston and the way that he felt comfortable speaking up about uh, perhaps there needs to be some sort of, system in place where referees will feel the uh, feel consequences uh, for incorrect calls. Uh, maybe that's allowed other players to feel empowered to, to speak in that manner. Yeah. And I think too, you know, thinking about this, like there's been all these 
you know, bigger picture topics about just improving the game, right? Like, you know, low management has been a huge conversation. And I think the refereeing conversation, this is obviously not the not the first time uh, this has come up. Like, you know, as, as the playoffs are approaching too, like, you know, do you have any thoughts in terms of just like how, you know, players and the refs can really close this gap? Because it seems like the relationship, like you mentioned, is just like getting worse and deteriorating. Nope. I think it's going to be a... Uh, uh... A tale as old as time, and I, I don't think it's going to get better. I don't know if it's going to get much worse than this, honestly. I think this is a um, you know a, a product of the 24-7 news cycle where I'm sure there were players in the past that would complain about the refs, and it would end up in the local paper, and we wouldn't all be talking about it uh, in Canada and America and all the 28 NBA cities. So I, I'm not so sure this is some um, – uh, a symptom of, of some greater problem. Uh, but there's a lot of pressure uh, and everybody involved in the NBA to win. And the easiest scapegoat is, is to blame the referees. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think in, in this case with Fred, I mean, it's clear that, you know, him and Ben Taylor just don't really get along. Um, you know, we have the stats here. Ben Taylor's officiated six games that Fred Evelyn has played in. Uh, Fred has received technicals in four of those, including one where he got ejected. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think there is something of a personal issue sort of between the two of them, but I think in the, maybe the general frustration that Fred's speaking about is like, from what I understand it, like officiating, you could take sort of two general approaches, broad, broadly speaking, there's more of like the collaborative, let's kind of settle everyone down, try to like really stay calm and sort of really look, I mean, the players get very emotional. We know that. And, and of course, like the officials are under a lot of uh, pressure from the fans. So there's one type where it's like, let's try to get everyone going. Let's kind of calm the game down. Let's talk to everybody. Let's give them leeway. And then I think the other way is more like it's, it's I'm, I'm the law. I'm the law here. Like I walk in like a sheriff. I walk in like a cop and you're going to do what I say. Otherwise, you know, it, it's you're either out or you're getting a tech or whatever. I'm not putting up with this kind of stuff. Um, and I, I do think that, um, you know, when you saw the Scott Fister, uh, the, the Scott Foster incident with, with Scotty, that was definitely a case of more of the cop-based approach towards officiating. And I do think even in, in Ben Taylor's case, um, I'm not too familiar with his career, and, and obviously he doesn't have a, you know, record as long as, as, as Scott Foster does, but, you know, it's kind of in that same school from what I understand. And so I think that for players, they definitely a, – a, they probably appreciate the the first approach much better of like the sort of the community aspect of let's talk through these things together. Let's sort of discuss it. We even saw a great clip when um, we saw Chris Finch uh, mic'd up and he talked to the officials and they had a good healthy dialogue that they were able to show on the broadcast where it was like, Hey, tell me about sort of this play and sort of like, what can I, what are you going to call tonight? Because then I can go into halftime and tell my team and my players that so we can all sort of work together under the rules. Right. I think where you don't want to see is a sort of like really strict cop like approach that a, a lot of the refs have taken. And so for Fred, I mean, look, listen, Fred knew what he was doing. He, you know, thought about it at the start of the interview, um, didn't initially go into this rant. But once he was asked enough times with officiating, you could tell a switch, you know, one in his head. And he's like, you know what? I will pay 50K for this. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and I do wonder how much the fine will be. Um, yeah, the the fine's gonna be uh, astronomical, and and I feel like a part I mean, of it too. Players union, they won't be astronomical. I, I feel like a part of it, but I feel like they're gonna fine them whatever the maximum amount that that, that they can, because yeah, um, this is pretty direct. And I think I think the other thing too is like not to take away from from you know this you know obviously there's a history between Fred and and Ben Taylor, but like. I think it's just the frustration of the season as well, right? Yeah, for sure. Like, you know, the Raptors are in a different position here. I'm sure Fred would, would probably maybe take a different approach versus this. But, you know, the season has been uh, really frustrating for them. Um, speaking of uh, up and down, I, I would yeah, what's up, back, Dave? Though, just to interrupt, I just would push back to say that this is you're seeing more and more referees uh, taking that tact as, mm. as they manage a the game. I mm. don't agree with that whatsoever. And... I've seen I, Ben Taylor. I honestly had to Google him. I, I, I was familiar with him, but I can't say that I can recall watching him. <laughs> you were familiar with Ben Taylor's game? Uh, <laughs> no, no. Okay. I was unfamiliar <laughs> with you, sir. But Scott Foster, I've seen him be collaborative umpteen times. Mm -hmm. It's not like he's only tossing out tees and giving guys a stiff arm when they want to discuss what he's seeing on the court. So I, I just, I, I think we got to give some nuance here. These referees aren't robots. And even the mm -hmm. ones that call that get called out for a negative interaction with the player, 
you know, we're not seeing them uh, be uh, uh, you know, strictly one way. You know, they're, they can be emotional, just like players can be emotional sometimes. But I don't know of a referee where it's like, you know, they only rule by the iron fist. Yeah, I, I think the other thing, too, and this might be separate from, you know, Fred and Ben Taylor, but it's just in general, I think, on the player side, you know, maybe some of the younger players um, also need to learn how to, like, just build relationships with these refs, right? Like like how, Will, you were referring to Chris Finch having a conversation that was constructive uh, with a referee. Um, like, I look at a player, I look at a player like Scotty Barnes here because we watch him, you know, a lot here in Toronto. And I think a lot of fans watching him this year have noticed, like, when he's not getting the calls, you'll see him with his body language, throwing his hands up. And a lot of times he'll do that over several possessions and, like, I want to see more of just conversation and understanding. I think there's a lot of players, and I'm sure you've seen that over the years, Dave, of players just building these relationships. You don't necessarily have to agree with every call, but you have to understand where the refs are coming from and thinking more long-term instead of just getting angry all the time in the moment, right? Yeah, I mean, something the Lakers do, and I don't know if every team across the the board does this, but I'm you know, in the Lakers visiting locker room um, on the road all the time, there'll be sheets printed out with like factoids about the referees. Like, you know, this is their hometown. This is where they went to college. This is their favorite app on their phone. This is the best vacation they've ever been on. This is the show that they're watching on Netflix on and on and on uh-huh. with the hopes that the players, when they're, you know, are, are dawdling in, in the locker room pregame, maybe take in some of that knowledge and then use it to make some sort of personal connection with the referee to enhance these type of conversations that, I, I think we all agree generally will help the sport. That's yeah. interesting. I've heard Nick t- uh, take a similar approach actually here in Toronto. Yeah. Well, I've got um, Ben Taylor's uh, profile pulled oh. up. So all right, let's for, hear it. for next time, the Raptors <laughs> see Ben Taylor. His favorite TV show is the West Wing. Um, his favorite mm-hmm. movie is Field of Dreams. Um, favorite musician is Brian McKnight. And his favorite meal is a uh, cheeseburger and tater tots. All right. Yeah. So are we sure he wasn't <laughs> cryogenically frozen in like 1991 and then reanimated in 2023 to be a, a, a ref? Like that is a profile of a man in 1991. Yeah. And well, to add to that, Dave, uh, his bucket list is to play golf at Augusta National. So it all lines up. Okay. There we go. Yeah. So it really does all line up. Well, We're learning a lot about Ben Taylor today, which is, uh, <laughs> I don't know if that's a good or bad thing. Um, well, now he's familiar well with his game. Yeah, now, now, yeah. now, now, McTen is a familiar Ben Taylor's game. But you know, switching, <laughs> switching to the Lakers. Um, you know, obviously they've been playing better lately. The you know LeBron's still out. I believe the timeline on on his right foot injury is expected to be evaluated in a few weeks. So that's coming down towards the end of the uh, end of the regular season. Lakers have won six of their last eight. Anthony Davis has been playing incredible. They're they're ninth in the West now. Um, you know, you've obviously been following this team all season and, and, and for several seasons here. Um, you know, what's the ceiling that you put on the on, on this Lakers team as, as they're making this push up, uh, considering all the deadline acquisitions that they made? We'll have to start with the caveat of health. And, mm-hmm. and that means the guys that are currently healthy stay healthy and the guys that are currently hurt in D'Angelo Russell, Mo Bamba, and LeBron James get back on the court. But if they maintain this level of cohesion and intensity over the final month of the regular season, plus they get guys back in the lineup, like I don't, I don't think there really is a ceiling. I don't want to be, oh my gosh, oh, what about the, all the other teams? It's not that, but it, you know, they will have the requisite confidence and desire, uh, and obviously they would have a track record of playing pretty good ball for the you know five or six weeks straight that. I don't think there's a team in the Western Conference. Now, the Eastern Conference may be different. I think there's a couple of teams that have separated themselves in the East. But I don't think there's a team in the Western Conference that you can tell me or you can convince me that the Lakers cannot beat if they have those factors I just said going for them. Playing good ball for a month straight, everybody healthy. uh, And, um, you know, not just healthy, but, yeah, you know, LeBron James. You need LeBron James looking like LeBron. Okay, that's part of the equation as well. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the other big part is just, like, you need AD playing in his best. And of late, I mean, AD has just been dominating. Um, you know, obviously, you've seen it up close. I mean, 30, 15, 28, and 19, 38, and 5, 39, and 8, 30, and 22. Like, man, he's gone on this run. And I think that 
I mean, is this just a product of sort of him stepping up in LeBron's absence, or do you feel like this is just AD getting back to what AD can do, which is, uh, you know, on his day, like right up there with maybe, okay, maybe slightly below Jokic and Embiid, but on that quality of like just purely dominant centers that you really can't do anything about? When he's been out this season, this has been the player he's been. I, he missed 20 straight games because of a complicated uh, foot injury. Uh, but the way Darvin Nam describes it, when Anthony is pain-free, we get a different player. And so I think this has mm-hmm. indicated that he is pain-free. And certainly he's taken up more of the offensive load while LeBron's been out. But the defensive side, side of things has always been what he cares about most. And since the All-Star break, Lakers are ranked number one in defensive efficiency. Oh. And and that is not just the steals and deflections and block shots that Anthony Davis gets, but that's his presence and his overall thrust getting the team to play in, a, in that manner. Yeah. Um, you know, the other player that they subtracted uh, at the deadline was obviously uh, Russell Westbrook, who ended up on the Clippers and had a chance to, to you know, watch him last night. Um, how bad was, was the Lakers locker room, Dave, like before the deadline? Cause you'd read like snippets of it and you'd see, obviously you see these social media clips of, you know, Westbrook during games and things like that. I think it was highlighted when LeBron set the scoring record. Like how important was it for the, for them to, to move on from, from Russ to, to really try to, you know, obviously do something this season. I think it was paramount because the pieces had to fit. You know, I don't think like there was a struggle in terms of, worrying about who Russ was as a person or anything like that. Um, but once he got on the basketball court, because his game didn't fit with the other guys around him, they didn't get the best version of Russell Westbrook, um, I, you know, in terms of uh, being level-headed, in terms of, you know, buying into the team structure, because he was still focused individually trying to find his rhythm. And, and it's hard when you have one person maybe – going outside of what the team asks are in order to, you know, to legitimately, he wanted to get his game right so he could help the team. But the team was kind of like, well, we, we're we running out of patience here. We, we, we don't have time to, to wait for that. And so, you know, eventually Rob Flink has deserved some credit because most of the deals the team was considering in the last off season was like using two first round picks to get off of Russell Westbrook. They ended up being patient. They get to be a better team. And all I had to do was one first round pick that's top four protected. Uh, and, you know, it wasn't just Russell Westbrook, though. You know, Patrick Beverly, um, th- th- that was another personality that there were some conflicts in that locker room with. <laughs> yeah, my, my, my favorite thing uh, about that LeBron uh, that night when he set the scoring record is so many of the guys you see in the clips uh, were not on the team two days later. Uh-huh. Uh, like like th- like Thomas Bryant was asking for the ball in the low post. Um, right. You know, you obviously talk about Westbrook and Beverly. Um, that's 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 my favorite thing, Dave, from from that night. Yeah, it was it was an odd time. It just the 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 way <laughs> um, it, it it just happened to go right. If LeBron misses a couple more games earlier on in the season or plays a couple more games earlier on in the season because of his various injuries. Uh, then you get it done a couple weeks before the trade di- deadline. But it was just everything coming to a head. And you know, obviously, Adrian Wojnarowski reported that there was uh, a verbal uh, sparring match between Russell Westbrook and LeBron at halftime mm-hmm. of that game. Like, you know, that, excuse me, Russell Westbrook and Darvin Ham. Excuse mm-hmm. me, I don't want to get that wrong. Adrian Wojnarowski reported Russell Westbrook and Darvin Ham. Um, and, you know, that that just tells you that if in that moment, you know, because anyone who's an historian of the game recognizes how important that, that record is that, that LeBron was setting or how uh, resonant that record is. If in that moment you can't put aside, you know, what you're thinking about your game personally in order to achieve this, um, you know, it's pretty telling. And, and, and certainly I think there was only about 48 hours later before the trade deadline occurred. 
No, it's funny you mention that because um, it did remind me of remember in Cleveland when LeBron hit the game winner, I think against Minnesota over Jimmy Butler. Oh, and then yes. he jumped up and celebrated and Isaiah <laughs> Thomas. Yeah. yeah, he's like, yo, LeBron, what a great moment. He's like, nah, man, Chetty Osmond, get over here. Chess bought me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, right. it was right before the trade deadline. Well, look, listen, I think the Lakers, as you mentioned, like they, they did really well in terms of flipping mm-hmm. Russ into more depth. I mean, that was the original issue was that the Lakers took away a lot of their, their depth pieces and their flexibility to get Russ in the door in the first place. At least they're able to rectify that mistake and add other guys. I mean, they brought in D'Angelo Russell, Jared Vanderbilt, Malik Beasley, Mo Bamba. I, I would consider Rui Hachimura a trade deadline mm. acquisition as well, just because it was acquired around the deadline. Out of those five guys, like who's made the biggest impact and sort of like who are keepers for the Lakers in this scenario? Well, you know, I think out of those five, the, the guy undisputed uh, in terms of making uh, his presence felt is Jared Vanderbilt uh, because – not only has he had some some bright moments in terms of the stats, but it's just the overall uh, shift in their defensive intensity that they've been able to achieve with Vanderbilt involved in those lineups. Um, you know, obviously, he was a star defensively against the Dallas Mavericks in that 27-point comeback. Uh, it was just you know harassing Luka Doncic all over the court, leading to the steals, deflections. Uh, scoring on the other end, but there are other nights where, you know, he may only have, you know, something like six points and four rebounds, but his presence is known. Um, There's big hopes for D'Angelo Russell uh, to be a difference maker for them. Obviously he's been out with a sprained ankle and um, it's trending towards him returning to the lineup Friday. Um, uh, But, you know, there hasn't been enough of a sample size there. Uh, Beasley, they needed his skill set. He's only really gotten hot in about two of the eight games or so that he's played. Um, but um, they're hoping that that can be a more frequent occurrence. Uh, Bob has been hurt. Uh, you know, um, Devon Reed isn't really in the rotation. And Rui has been interesting. He's had games where he's looked fantastic. He's had other games where he floats a little bit and you question his motor. Uh, and you question also if he's not scoring, uh, it, you know, does he need the scoring carrot to get, himself going on the defensive end um so there's been some some question marks with him but but certainly he's shown flashes of of being a highly skilled player so kind of a mixed bag but i think the the biggest uh you know uh, gold star that that this group attains is that that they've been winning since they've been involved and and so you know they've looked like winning players um a lot of the times yeah um you know dave before we let you go you know, we were talking earlier about how you weren't familiar with Ben Taylor's game. Um, you know, Will here isn't too familiar with your game either. I was explaining to him how back in the day when you were coming up, you were the ghostwriter of Gilbert Arenas' blog <laughs> on NBA.com. And I believe, did you originally have like a 10 things column? Is that where McTen? I did, from? yeah. Yeah, like wow. yeah, 10 wow. things. Very similar to the, you know, the concept of Zach Lowe's today. I'm not sure. saying Zach Lowe took it from it. You can say it. No, say it right now. Say it right now. Say it without saying it. No, but like 10 things I saw in the league that week. You know, anything Uh from, uh, you know, funky retro jersey to uh, out of bounds play to a new lineup that a team was using. That's amazing. And what's the story? Um, I'd love to hear just the backstory. Like, how did you end up getting that gig to to ghostwrite uh, for Gilbert Arenas? Because I remember reading that blog. So it was early on in the season and, and, um, or I guess early on in training camp. And I was the junior level staffer on the NBA.com editorial side. Um, there's a news side and kind of like a feature side. And the guy who you know, was our senior writer at the time, Jeff Denge, who's now, you know, the, one of the big wigs at runner's world, I believe, um, uh, yeah, we writes about, about that endeavor. Um, he was overseas covering a, a team's training camp in like Japan or something like that. And the scheduled first interview for the quote unquote blog with Gilbert Arenas was a date when he would be still overseas. And so it just kind of got kicked down to the junior level guy and me. And, uh, you know, back then, it, you know, blog was like such a novel concept. So NBA.com wanting to be on, on the cutting edge of it, wanted to present content as if, players were directly blogging for uh, their site, but it was really, it was an interview process, uh, you know, and, and you find the player's voice and you, you edit down, you know, the, the entry 
to be, you know, something that is representative of what the player is thinking, but but certainly, you know, it, it's involving uh, a reporter on, on the other end. Um, and that day, the, for the first one, you know, we were promised from the Wizards like 10 minutes of time with Gilbert. And I took a train down from New York to D.C. and um, ended up hanging with him in the Players' Lounge at then I think it was the MCI Center for like 45 minutes. Mm. And we just we just hit it off. Uh, we're roughly you know, very similar in age and similar interests and can talk basketball until our head falls off. So, uh, yeah, and then it just continued like where it was supposed to be, you know, I reach out to the Wizards PR department and they wrangle a time with Gilbert on the phone. Well, at some point we cut out the middleman. It was just Gilbert would text me. You know, at all hours, sometimes at midnight, sometimes at 6 a.m., just one word blog. And, uh, okay, I, I need to go find a, a quiet place to have a conversation with him and be able to record the conversation so I can transcribe it afterwards. And um, you know, we had some entries that were like 2,500 words long. We had some entries that were like 200 words long. Uh, it was just kind of – sometimes I would bring stuff to the table. I'd Google alerts on Gilbert so I'd know anything that was going on, uh, things were saying about him. Uh, but sometimes, you know, he wanted to get something off his chest, you know, after he was cut from the U S Olympic team in 2006, he went on this vengeance tour against anybody involved in that team, uh, particularly the coaches, uh, you know, he, he, he wanted to get blood when he goes out against the sun, because Mike D'Antoni is the coach and he's on Mike Krzyzewski's coaching staff. Um, and so it was a great time. A lot of things converged. Gilbert was you know, one of the leading scorers in the league that, that time and, and really taking advantage of um, finding ways to use his personality to promote uh, his brands. You know, like sneaker colorways, we're so used to having sneakers come out in, in different, uh, you know, design patterns these days. But, you know, back in 2006, 2007, like you're maybe getting three colorways of a sneaker. And he's like, no, no, how about, Adidas, I'm going to partner with all my brands that I have relationships with. So we'll have the, the Adidas Gil Zero but in the Hibachi colorway. Uh, and, you know, we're going to partner with, you know, an Hibachi restaurant. And we're going to have the one in the PlayStation colorway. And, you know, obviously partner with Sony. And, yeah, he was, he was ahead of his time in many ways. And, you know, injuries and a prank gone awry. Uh, <laughs> Is that what you're calling it, a that. prank? <laughs> no, it was, I, mean, it was I, a prank. I guess it was it a prank. Was a, it was, it was one of many he pranks, in, too, because uh, the Andre Blatchblatt prank movie. is good, too. Yeah, yeah, he brought in movie prop uh, firearms, uh, you know, uh, in order to to make a guy look foolish, uh, obviously, but it was a prank, but going to anticipate it with Tavares Crittenden had in his locker. <laughs> <Yo>. <laughs> he literally yeah. picked the, the, the one person he should not have picked <laughs> to prank. Yeah. Should have just put right. some popcorn in his car like a, like everyone else does. That's, That's a right. prank to me. Um, I, I still wouldn't do that to Javaris for the record. <laughs> oh, man. But now, <laughs> and, and now look at Dave McMenamin, you know? One, one of, the, one of the best in the game. Oh, every, every, everybody's got an origin story, you know? So. That's a sick one. <laughs> yeah. No, I appreciate you, Dave. We'd love to have you on uh, later in the season as well. I know you're busy. Yeah, we got more follow-up questions about your career, by the way. Lots. Yeah. yeah. You know. All right, we'll do it. We'll do it another time. Sounds good, fellas. Okay. Talk to you soon, Dave. All right. Take care. All right. We are going to take a quick break. I'm your host, Willu, and that's Alex Wong. You're listening to the Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network.
Welcome back to the Raptor Show on this the Sports Night Radio Network. I'm your host, William Liu. I continue to be joined by producer and co-host Alex Wong. Uh, we are endeavoring to get another primetime LA reporter on the line, Dan Wykey of the LA Times. Um, yeah, and part of the reason we want to get him on, not just to talk about the LA teams, which obviously the Raptors are playing two games in LA. Um, part of the reason we want to get him on is because we have a personal funny story involving Dan Wykey, where um, thinking back to happier times in 2019 when Alex and I were, were covering the NBA Finals and uh, the Raptors obviously were making that historic run. Um, I remember very distinctly that in the finals, we got seated in the expanded media section because obviously the media section has got to expand when you're hosting the NBA Finals, right? In the 100s. In the 100s, like just behind, like directly behind the, 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 the net, I think in like the 118 kind of section or something yeah. like that. And... Um, Yeah, we would always sit there and we would obviously, you know, we were more muted, let's say, in our in our in our cheering and the excitement of the team just because of the occasion. I mean, I heard you sing the whole national anthem before game one. All right, that's that's part of being a Canadian citizen is uh, cheering, sitting, singing "Oh Canada." I mean, you know, no, but, I, I but love this yes, country, the rest obviously. of it is true. We were muted. We were, we were professionals. We were professionals, but we were definitely more excited than the average NBA reporter at the NBA Finals. But well, we always sat beside Dan Wykey. So, Dan, <laughs> do you remember sitting beside us? Because um, you know, we were trying to talk about happier times in 2019 in the NBA yeah. Finals in Toronto. So I love that finals, like with a all capital letters. L O V E D um, had it. So I was there a lot because of Kawhi Leonard, right? Oh like yeah. I was sort of on the, I was on the, um, the free, I was writing the free agent prologue. <laughs> we'll say for the season. Right. And I, I actually was in Burnaby um, in training camp for a couple of days hmm. with the Raptors even. Right. Wow. Like, I mean, that's how bad of a secret this was, right. That he was probably going to be in my leg. But, but I will say, um, I do remember seeing by you guys. I do remember that O Canada. Um, you know, I think, did we get a Sarah McLaughlin O Canada before one of those games? I think so. I yeah. want to say that was true, yeah. I don't happen. know. It was like like yeah, a very mean, emotional for for just a national anthem. It was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was an awesome crowd. And it's one of those things that I think, you know, like, I, and I'm, I, will, uh, I will probably miss O Canada on Friday at um, crypto.com arena because they, they do it so early mm. pregame. I'll probably still be stuffing my face or something pregame. But um, I will say, like, when you hear it at, at Scotiabank Arena, like, and the crowd is into it, and it's a big game, like, and I got to do it a bunch that postseason, it, it, it's pretty special, right? Like, it is sort of the perfect blending of, like, what I would consider to be, like, hockey and basketball cultures. Oh, yeah. Because like, there are some really good national anthems in the NHL. I'm from Chicago. Um, I think the, the the opera singer at the United Center, um, while the crowd cheers the entire way, is like a cool national anthem. It, that, that doesn't happen in the NBA. Anywhere else but at Scotiabank Arena. So you're, you're, you're excused. You're allowed to cheer for O Canada, I would say. <laughs> I can't believe Dan actually remembers. Yeah. Oh, we remember Dan too, man. Oh, yeah. This, this, no, I remember you, Dan You always very well. were able to use the media voucher to I, get. I, I, uh, I will tell you something. I, I will oh. give you a piece of media gossip from that final. But I still tell the story all the day. I will not say who it's about, though. Oh, um, there okay. was someone else sitting in our area who came to, um, I want to say, game one of the Eastern, or uh, it was uh, it would have been game three, right, of the Eastern Conference Finals. I believe they started in Milwaukee. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Game three. Um, yeah. Oh, and who ate concession stand uh, wings, right, and got sauce all over that black uh, linen um, table topper they were using. Uh, and it was there the entire finals. That's, that's Oh, man. Dan, that's please nasty. text me the culprit after. I really need to know. Yeah, well, there, um, there's actually okay. a, a really much worse version of that that happened this year where uh, an unnamed reporter from an unnamed visiting team um, happened to be very unfortunately the victim of uh, a throw up incident. <laughs> oh man! Oh, no. I, I'll just leave it there. I'll just leave it there. This, this is nobody's business. Oh, no. it, it is just a someone who was recently vomited on by a baby. Um, that's terrible. Yeah, it wasn't a baby. That's it was awful. an adult this time. In in a in a, in a you know, even worse. Because yeah, the Raptors media seats in the 100s are like right below a, a private box. Oh, that's right. Anyway, and that's what happened. <laughs> was it a was it a flu was it a flu based vomit or was it a booze based? 
I, I think probably the latter. I think the latter. But what's the difference? Uh, Bolson. It was a Bolson moment. Oh, man. We got names for them now. No, it's funny, Dan, because you talk about that year. Uh -huh. And obviously, we, we revisit that year a lot. And, like, you know, I didn't know you were basically yeah. the, the Lawrence Frank of, of media. Yeah, I was, was going to say, who was here more, you or Lawrence <laughs> Frank? <laughs> just trailing uh, Kawhi the entire time. And, like, obviously, here in Toronto, as the Raptors were making their run, you know, into the finals and then, you know, winning the finals, the hope started to go up here that, that you know, how could a player – that just yeah. won a championship here, you know, at least he would come back for a year. But based on you obviously following the team um, and, you know, following the Clippers' pursuit, you know, was there any ever doubt in your mind, you know, as, as the Raptors are making this run that, hey, maybe he wasn't going to go to the Clippers after the season? I, I, yeah, I think there was one moment, and it was the, um, the day in free agency where, like, it became like the O.J. Simpson chase. Mm. Where like the okay. helicopters and the Trevor copters were following like what people thought was Kawhi Leonard's van around Toronto. Wait, that wasn't but Kawhi's van from the airport. I mean, I thought it was. It might have been a decoy. Yo, no. like, oh my god! Like, Yo, come on, we man. were following Jeremy this, Castleberry this, this whole time. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. it was. It was Jeremy Castle. It was Jeremy Castleberry's van. It's probably. It might have been Lawrence Frank who sent it. And um, you know, it, that day I was like, man, this is a lot of love. And, like, you know, will it be, um, you know, because, like, Kawhi and I had, like, briefly discussed sort of, like, we had, like, one, one time, one of my trips up there, we had a, like, kind of, like, isn't it so weird to be an American in Canada question, like, conversation? Like, you know, like, man, Netflix is wild, right? Like, the movies are different and stuff like that. And he was so unfazed by, like, like this dude didn't really do much like i mean i think he thought it was weird that you know speed limits weren't kilometers like that was like the one thing he couldn't get best but everything else was like and i don't think that's why he left uh, no put that in the headline weird. man Kawhi left because you know, he, he didn't like kilometers <laughs> the metric system he's very anti the metric system no we're but sensible like, everything was, uh, don't make fun of the metric system it makes more sense the, the rest he, of the world uses it. he was i know right yeah. this, this is our bad no it's all good for hours like we're really the wrong ones um, but, like, I do think, though, that it was, like, maybe at that moment I thought it was either the Clippers or Toronto. Mm -hmm. I never really believed the Lakers as yeah. being, like, super in on it. It just didn't fit. And I think in hindsight, it really doesn't fit. You know, um, it seems sort of probably like a ploy that was used to get the, the Paul George deal done. Um, and, you know, here we are, right? Uh, what is that? Is that four years ago? Yeah, four seasons. Oh, don't remind yeah. us, man. Come on. Four seasons Yeah, later. And, and I mean, but it's, it, 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 it is sort of wild, because like, I do remember that summer being like, man, all the basketball in the world is going to be played in L.A. for the next, like, six years. Like, I could not be in a better place to watch big game basketball. Mm. And there was one finals that happened in Orlando. <laughs> you know, and right. it's like, I, I don't know. I, I don't think there's been a game where Anthony Davis, Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, LeBron James, it's been years since all four of them were on the court together. Yeah. Damn. No, I mean, honestly, like, it's, uh, it, it was definitely, like, a very memorable year, right? But I, I think we all in the back of our minds, like, understood that, that Kawhi was very clear in his intentions. He made it known without mm -hmm. explicitly saying, like, hey, I'm leaving and going to L.A. no matter what. But we all knew that, and I think that our hope was just, like, look, you know, can you run it back one year, just defend the title? And listen, whatever, that, that's all past history, but... um. No, it is. It is always fun to look back on that time. By the way, Kawhi looked awesome tonight or last night, and um, just continues to be great. Oh yeah, right across the board. Um, yeah, I mean, we want to. So we've been having a lot of conversations about the Lakers, and you know, we're just thinking ahead to the, the Raptors are, you know, in a similar boat with the Lakers, with like ten other teams in the league. They're like hovering around five hundred, and they're trying to get out of the playing scenario. Yep. So every game is a must win. And we were just talking to Dave McMenamin, who was describing the Lakers as having the number one defense um, in the league post deadline yes and I'm, so i'm not familiar with this reporter you're speaking of but he's sound <laughs> oh okay i got you got you you know what we, he's not familiar with dave McMenamin's of, game yeah <laughs> we actually had a conversation about of, this too um but yeah i mean like if, if you were the, if you were the raptors and you're trying to approach like how to yeah. score on the lakers i feel like obviously the raptors are going to need to solve this problem today and tomorrow um yeah how would you go about like are there are there weak spots for the raptors to attack on the lakers defense even right now when they're playing great i mean i think they're there's probably two right it's like one like you want to get them in transition okay sort of sure. everybody yeah um but like force turnovers 
Um, you know, whether or not D'Angelo Russell plays up in the air, right? Like, seems like it's headed in that direction, but mm. it sort of seemed like he would have played on Monday, too, um, earlier this week. Like, so um, that's one, right? Is like turn them over, get them into transition. And then I think, um, especially, I think, in the, in the second half, especially in third quarters, like attack, attack, attack. Um, like find, like adjust an attack, like use, use your continuity, use the fact that you have a coach and a group of players that have been together for years and try your best to exploit that the Lakers are like still in the, like sit in a circle, get to know each other, say what your favorite cereal is phase of getting to know each other mm. as a basketball team, right? Like that this is a team that is still, you know, D'Angelo Russell has missed more games than he's played for the Lakers. Um, you know, that they are still new. And so put them into rotations, um, you know, make them adjust. You have a first year head coach, make him adjust. I, I think that would be um, the way and uh, probably try to stay away from Anthony Davis. Yeah. That sounds like a great idea. Um, I think those are all great points. Yeah. He's been awesome. Um, yeah. Man, I mean, it's, it's funny. Like we talked, you, you guys mentioned Kawhi, like 80, um, like really like, I mean, the injuries are what they are. If it hadn't been for the injuries, like having sort of a defensive player of the year type, like yeah. really has been that that dominant on that side of the floor, best rebounding year of his career, um, and it's just you know like any good AD season he's missed twenty five games. I mean, look, it, it comes to the territory. Um, you know, you, you were talking about Darvin Ham and, and being the first year head coach. Um, how do you think Darvin's done this mm-hmm. year? I mean, obviously it's this is a difficult season to sort of like coach yeah. everything you had Westbrook to deal with you had LeBron it's all the pressure and AD and, and the, the, the Lakers market is always very difficult um how's he done so far this year I think he's handled like a lot of the intangibles like incredibly well mm-hmm. right I mean I think the the biggest thing is that this is a team that by and large has played hard every night this season which is I think generally speaking a victory in coaching that's you like know, half the battle in the regular season yeah, if you can keep your team locked in and competitive year long, like that, that's a big deal. Um, it also sort of speaks to their roster challenges early because they were playing really hard and losing a bunch of games too. Um, which usually, if you play really hard in the NBA, like you're above 500 almost always. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's like he's been good at that. I think he handled the Westbrook situation as well as he could have. Um, you know, I think he at times has leaned too heavily on small lineups, but they were a small team. And I, and I think he has been at times slow to adjust, right? Like, I think that he is game plan driven and believes in his game plans and stuff like that, and they tend to stick with what they're doing. And some nights that works great, and other nights John Moran scores 28 points in that quarter. And, like, you know, the Lakers don't really switch a coverage. They don't really adjust too much, and, you know, it costs them a game. So, you know, I think he's learning, right? Like, it's, this has not been um, a crazy rapid ascent, like, you know, to – the top tier of NBA coaches. Um, I think it's taken time, but I think there's been like the personality management part of this, I think has gone really, really well. And then I think the basketball part of it is sort of like, it's so muddied by all the other sort of stuff they've had, the injuries, uh, you know, like one of the complaints sometimes you hear from scouts is that like they don't run or they weren't running, especially early in the first half of the season, like that complex of sets, which is like, okay, that's a fair that's a fair criticism, but then it's also sort of like, well, but they also like their best play is a LeBron James Anthony Davis pick and roll. So like, yeah, like why muck this up? You know, what I mean? like it, maybe it doesn't have to be that complex. And now that they've added like Malik Beasley, like they've added some more stuff off the ball and they've, they've moved and stuff like that. I mean, when, but when I started talking to people about Darvin Ham, like X's knows like wasn't really a concern. You know, I mean, I think right. people believe that that he he's well well schooled in that is played for a ton of great coaches um worked with mike budenholzer forever mm-hmm. you know but I, I i think there's you know the things like the feeling out of uh, in terms of in-game adjustments and stuff like that i think is uh occasionally he's gotten lost i think in games like there was a game earlier this year where i think he played like a, a lineup for like nine straight minutes in the fourth quarter and then kept him in in overtime but like, he kind of got caught up in the game a right. little bit i think sometimes that's happened but uh you know by and large, I mean, I think it hasn't been a really easy road, and here they are somehow in mid March, and they feel good about themselves. It's like that seems like a win. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it just makes sense, right? Like you, you have, like 
the biggest personality in basketball in LeBron to manage, and you got to work with him. Mm. It's not like working with any other sort of player relationship, right? So if you can stay on their good side and, of course, win totally over some of the, the vets and stuff, and, like, yeah, you, you go from there, and then, of course, you can, you know, do the rest of the stuff as a coach. But, um, yeah, Dan, we've run out of time, but we appreciate you. All right, it was great looking back on 2019, um, you know. Uh, it was just, very fun. Yeah. You know, honestly, I would love to call you again and, and ask for more behind the de- scenes details on on the whole tampering. Appro- I mean, sorry, I, I mean uh, from the finals, the finals, the tampering, all of it, freshie. man. I ate, I ate so much freshie and and and. Oh, month. that freshie! <laughs> Yo, oh, Dan, why you showing how freshie is killing? Nah, me. man, that's how I know. Oh man. Yo, yeah. Dan, Dan's an honorary Canadian, man. Damn. Damn. Did you get the energy balls? Because you can get the bowl and the energy oh, ball for exactly yeah. twenty five yeah, bucks. The, the bowl and the energy ball. Yeah. <laughs> it was my. I had it. I want to say I want to. I think like eleven times in one postseason. Yeah, that's right. amazing. Well, it's great. At least it's healthy. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. We'll talk to you soon. Appreciate you. All right, guys. Be good. Thank you. It was Jolly Ranchers. Dan always had a pack of Jolly Ranchers as well. Was um was Freshy your go-to? I don't even remember what I used my voucher uh, for. Okay, you. here's the thing. So um during that finals run, yeah, we so we got the twenty-five dollar vouchers. Yeah. And you can eat at the concessions or wherever. Yes. Um. I mean, obviously, there are more tasty things in the arena other than Freshie, but if you're having to eat it, like, three, four times a week, yeah, you know, Freshie was a, was a sensible Unless you're, sensible like, a Lee Van Osman, and you just go poutine every time. Oh, the right? poutinery? Like, so, yeah. which, which, yeah, no, Freshie, I think, was a smart move. Yeah. So. Also, they had the hot stone carve, which I think they still have. Oh, okay. That is one of the driest sandwiches you can put out there. Mm. The, the bun is dry. It's oh, like a Kaiser roll. Out? And then they slice the meat, and the meat is dry. So and you single. chew into it, and you can't stop chewing. Like it actually, yeah, yeah. This is what I'm saying, man. Uh, oh yeah, Freshy was the. You know, the aside way. from the fact that we're probably gonna end up slandering half of the food establishments next year, they should just let us go in the arena and review every single place. Like, uh, you know just, what? I think MLSC, if they put us in charge for this, you know, I think we're actually. This continues qualified. my journey of turning us into uh, the Fung Bros in the second half. Of our <laughs> oh career. man, you know you always just... say you don't want us to be the Fung Bros, and, and here we are. <laughs> you know, Fung Broing it up, man. Sometimes you just gotta embrace on, who man. you are, man. Come on, man. Um, no, I'm really we're super gl- fresh in the arena. I'm really glad Dan remembers us because, <laughs> like, we've joked about this so many yeah, times. Yeah, yeah, I know. And I didn't. I, I was too nervous. Like, I, I'm too new to the game where I wasn't trying to speak to everyone. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. No, I had I a lot it. of these one-way interactions. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite no. <laughs> things was also seeing Stephen A. Smith in the Buck series, and we, we you and I were sitting, uh, standing courtside with Keyshawn, and oh, we just saw Stephen A. Smith walk at to the, center court, like in a suit, at right, center looking pretty court. good. Probably yeah. actually got kind of like a the pattern like this, and he walked to the center of the court, stood on the Raptors logo pregame, and yeah. just took a phone call for like twenty minutes, Amazing. and then later Amen. on, later on, I saw him in the media room in mm. the back. And he was sitting there with his iPad watching Mission Impossible. <laughs> and he had a staffer come over to him and take his order on what he wanted to eat and came back with a cheeseburger. <laughs> nah, man, there's different levels no, to this, No, that's man. a main he, man. He wasn't man. eating fresh. That's, that's a main sure. man. Man, by the way, shout out to a friend of the program, Holly McKenzie, who did text Dave McMenamin to remind him to come on the show today. So oh, she was the one who made it happen. the assist. Shout out to McTen. Shout out to Dan Waikie. And now it's time for Between the Lines, brought to you by Bet Rivers. Hmm. It's a whole new game. So the Toronto Raptors are taking on the Lakers tomorrow, right? right? right. Uh, the spread is not up on Bet Rivers at the moment. But as we've talked about throughout this episode, I think we know that this is a huge matchup for both teams. The Raptors are trying to avoid finishing one and four on this road trip. Um, <laughs> and the only win would be an oh, overtime victory over the Washington Wizards. Yeah, that game was great. Don't take it away from Listen, us. Listen, I think this is, you know, I, I'm stating the obvious here. This is huge for the Raptors. Yep. Could have won in Denver. Could argue could have won against the Clippers. Probably would like would like to get this one. So um, what are your thoughts in terms of key factors going into tomorrow's game? Um, first off, we should call this the the we need this bowl. We, the we need this road trip, okay? Oh, like okay. This, yeah, yeah, this is like... This is the this freshy is like, bowl. This is like yeah. Matt Devlin. To get fresh. This yeah. is like Matt Devlin calling we need this <laughs> on a Patrick Patterson corner three or like a Damari Carroll corner three in the playoffs right now. All right, we need this, all right? Yeah, we need this. So we need this in this game as well. Obviously, yeah. they already lost three games on this road trip. Um, um, yeah, so obviously, AD, look, I, I think the Raptors have done a, a generally a decent job defending AD mm. in the more recent times they played. Of course, some of those games, like, they had Mark, they had, you know, Surge, but I, I do anticipate the Raptors uh, at least having enough size to throw at AD, whether that's going to be Yaka Pertle or that's going to be occasionally shifts with OG on him. Mm-hmm. The Raptors always going to be very creative in that sense. I think, you know, speaking to the Lakers um, with their with their strong defense, 
the one thing is, as Dan mentioned, like they, they do have a smaller roster in general. And so I do anticipate the Raptors trying to um, attack through the post. Mm. Um, I think Scott, this would be a good matchup for Scotty to attack through the post, especially if he's getting guarded by a um, Malik Beasley or if he's getting guarded by like an Austin Reeves occasionally, something like that. Like they're, they're just, they have a smaller backcourt and the Raptors play big across the board. So there will be artificially created size mismatches for Toronto to sort of play through. I hope they do that a little bit more than trying to play downhill at, at AD, who has just been amazing on defense. Um, and I think Austin Reeves, by the way, the, every, every game I'm watching them, I'm mm. constantly impressed by him. Um, recently, yeah, he, in the last 11 games, he's averaging 13 points per game, shooting 57% from the field and also shooting above 50 from three, but it's more just like the, the game management skills. Like he's running more pick and rolls. He's up to four assists per game in that stretch as well. He's been scoring more efficiently. I think that, you know, that's their key reserve that the Raptors will need to match up against and they need to do a really good job of sort of limiting his touches and his impact on the game. And yeah, I mean, ultimately, look, I, I think the Raptors should match up well with the Lakers and, you know, with, with no LeBron there, you do expect them to win it because this is a great opportunity because the Raptors have now ducked LeBron twice this season. But you don't know, man. The Lakers are playing good basketball, and AD is playing like one of the best players in the game. But uh, that was Between the Lines, brought to you by Brett Rivers. It's a whole new game, and that does it for us today. I've been your host, Will Lou, and you've been listening to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network. Thanks once again to Dave McMenamin, Dan Waikey, producer and co-host Alex Wong, our board producer Derek Brandale, and Jennifer Olnick for helping with the YouTube stream. We'll see you tomorrow.